Now, African cities are in a race against time to modernize and ensure their relevance for the 21st century. The continent's uh, population is growing, and so is the number of people moving into cities in pursuit for a better life for themselves and their families. Currently, the city's resources are not keeping up with the pace of population growth, which presents challenges for both social and economic resources. Now, governments all across the continent are having conversations as to what they need to do to ensure the competitiveness and the viability of their cities in the modern world. This essentially is what we are doing here. We are here to find out what the city of Durban is doing to address these challenges challenges and also exploit the opportunities that this will bring. For the next hour, ladies and gentlemen, all our viewers at home, we will be engaging a number of speakers and yourselves as to what needs to be done to ensure that the growth of this new city is more inclusive for all. We'll be asking questions about the role of women in the new modern city. We'll be asking questions about the role of small businesses. We'll also be asking important questions about the role that the youth will play in shaping the city of Durban. On that note, I would like us to begin our discussion and I'd like to introduce our speakers who will be taking us forward this morning. I begin with Philip Sitole, seated on my left. He is the Deputy City Manager for Economic Development and Planning a Cluster. Balissa Peely, who is the CEO of the Durban Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who is uh, seated there on the very, very far left. Uh, coming back to uh, the speaker that is seated closer to me, uh, Dondo Nohajan, and the Director General at National Treasury. Next to him, we do have Mandisa Ndombele, who is the global shaper for the Durban Hub. And finally, uh, businessman Terry Rosenberg, the chairman of Multiply Group and Oakbrook. Uh, panelists, thanks so much for your time. Right, and uh, let's bring business in right now because we are uh, looking to the role of uh, business, the important role of business in holding hands with, with government and holding hands also with uh, labor in, 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 in taking the city uh, forward as we talk about this inclusive growth. Uh, Terry, uh, just talk to us a little bit about your, your, your business interests and exactly what it is that you do. Well, thank you, Fifi. Um, I thought just looking at the panelists that I was probably the oldest person here, but, <laughs> but I heard the chamber's 162 years old, you know, so <laughs> I've got a way to go. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak some positive narrative into an, a media environment that is pretty negative, you know, about a lot of things in our country. I think one point that I would like to raise is, in, is to the point of uh, our DG Zondo's points earlier, that partnership is a very important aspect of how we can get together, business, labor, and government. And to give you a practical example, this very convention center that we're sitting in uh, had its 21st birthday uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it was formed out of a public-private partnership called Operation Jump Jumpstart, which I initiated, and uh, we've got people in the room who were part of that, Andre Kapila and many others, um, John Bengu, and um, we, we had a vision to make this the conference center of Southern Africa. And uh, we had great support from the city, great support from labor and the, and the politicians. We worked together with a very clear focus. And the result of that over 21 years is that some 34 billion rand has been contributed to the South African economy. There have been 8,000 conferences held here with a, with a total of about 7.1 million uh, delegate nights. So there's just one example, Fifi, of, of how a partnership can work and many other thoughts as we go into the discussions this morning. Right. And of course, I mean, this is quite critical, the success of a partnership uh, achieving this uh, scale, given that right now we do have uh, both labor and business and government seeming to be on 
opposite sides of the fence, even though we certainly need to be on the same side if we're going to make this South Africa uh, the beautiful uh, country uh, that it, 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 it can, can certainly be. But Terry, as Balissa said, you were in that meeting. So business, business wants to have a partnership. You've got a practical example of how a partnership can work as you relate to us in your story in the beginning. I mean, I, I, I imagine there are lessons to be learned from that partnership that was brokered between um, yourselves and uh, government around 20 years ago. So share with us the, the, the lessons learned and how the city of Durban in trying to foster these new partnerships can improve on and what has already been uh, seen to be done uh, by yourselves and your partners? Well, uh, Fifi, you know, I, I think there's never one answer to, to business problems. You know, it's not like mathematics where you've either got the right answer or the wrong answer. But I think that um, if you look at all the projects, all the NGOs that are out there, and a lot of willingness from businesses' point of view to become involved, there's really three areas that we, we consider. The first one is vision, the second one is analysis, and the third one is implementation. So in, in this particular example, the vision was to make this the conference center of Southern Africa. That's all very well and good, you know, a lot of people sit around the table, talk about the vision, but you've got to analyze how you're going to do that, where you're going to raise the money, what kind of people have you got to get to run the situation, who's going to control it. How's it going to be sustainable? You do all that analysis work. And then the key part is you've got to implement. And, and I think if there is one thing that where I think we can help is that we, we, do, we do try and think that we at least can implement things. Whereas sometimes at government level, there's just so many things that are happening that the vision and the analysis is very powerful, but sometimes we fall down on the implementation. So I think that is where we can help. And just as one example in our own business, we, we're just continuing to invest in South Africa. This is my country, this is my region, I love it, I'm not going anywhere. And um, if we don't create jobs and, and growth, uh, we, we're not going to have a lovely country, we all know that. So in our little neck of the woods, we've got a, a property development, a 1.3 billion development that's creating 3,000 jobs. Now, you know, we have to make our own investment, we haven't got enough, we've got to go and raise the money to do it. Um, but we believe in, in this region. We've got, uh, you know, challenges that we've got to get uh, towards, but we can speak with Philip, we can speak with the mayor and the, and, and the mayoral office. We have direct uh, contacts uh, through the chamber. We're working together, you know, and, and what we always have to find is what role do we play? Are we in the visionary role? Are we in the implementation role? Can we contribute to some form of analysis? Right. But at the end of the day, the success in my opinion, is based on a clear focus to be able to implement the vision. Otherwise, we've got 10 people working on one thing, doesn't get implemented. Terry, recapturing the global age of partnership, how do we get back? So, <clears throat> I, I think that's a, a good question that, that Andrew asked, because the landscape has changed tremendously since the 90s. Uh, you mentioned the Growth Coalition, which is a, a follow-on grouping from Operation Jumpstart that helped to create this, the centre. In my opinion, they're doing an unbelievably good job because they've, they've formed a link between the business community and a direct relationship with local government and provincial government. So it's expanded not just into our region in, in, in Etiquini, but also throughout KZN. I think, uh, as, as uh, the DG mentioned, we've got to think of the smaller towns as well. And uh, we found it very effective as business people because we have a link when we've got a need to be able to get in through the Growth Coalition to help a lot of these projects happen. Uh, I think they're in the, the 10 to 15 billion rand kind of category where they're helping to shape various projects. It comes back to my point though earlier, Andrew, that you know, what role are you playing? Are you a visionary? Are you an analyst? Are you an implementer? You know? And there are many agencies doing different things what we're trying to do is to make that work together. One quick example, though, um, in, in getting to the areas that are less fashionable, let's say, than in Schlonga, you know, because I think, DG, you made that point, it's a very good point. Uh, you know, capital uh, is interested in one thing, you know, what's the return you're going to make on it? If you're emotionally involved, maybe you'll take a lesser return, maybe not even a return. But when you're taking money from offshore, um, they're interested in what kind of return. So 
I think one of the roles that we can play and that we are playing in our business is to find areas which are viable to create business in so that it can attract capital and therefore can provide a basis for growth. One quick example, Vicky, is um, uh, in the fintech area. Sure. Uh, we've got quite a big investment in fintech. It's a disruptive area. You know, Airbnb's disrupted the hotel industry, Uber's disrupted the taxi industry, and so on. You can't disrupt unless you've enabled. You know, it's got to be enabled first. Sure. Uh, we've got one example, a project that uh, we're running up in, in, in the Congo, because we, we're up in Africa as well, um, where there was a picture of a road with a bicycle in the middle of that road with a whole lot of saddlebags on it. And uh, what that was, was that gentleman was in the coal business. So he didn't have coal in the area where his bicycle was parked, but there was coal in the next town. He would take his bicycle to that town, but in the morning first, he would get hold of his smartphone. Uh, not a very uh, detailed, educated man, but complete ability to work the phone and also a good, strong entrepreneurial spirit. Call into the next town, find out how much coal they had, what calorific value it was, what the price was, and then went into his payment app to make payment, went with the bicycle with the saddlebags, filled it up with coal and took it back. Now, that may sound like a silly example, but he, fed, he feeds his family and his relatives and friends on that kind of business. So what we've got to be looking for and helping for in, in, in business, in my opinion, one of the things is which are the areas where we can focus on where business can be attracted in the less fashionable, let's say, areas, you know, because putting money into an Amschlange is important for the tourism industry. That creates jobs, you know, so, you know, we've got things on both hands.